Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Tech Innovation 2021. My name is Alvin, and I'm your host for today. In the next program, we will learn how designers are reinventing ideas, business models, and structures that are environmentally sustainable and can stand the test of time. Should you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the Q&A feature on your screen. We will answer your questions during the panel discussion towards the end of this session. First, we have Mark Wee of Design Singapore Council to give his opening remarks for this session. He will share his thoughts on how design plays an important role in conserving our natural resources and making this sustainability journey more accessible to all. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Mark Wee from the Design Singapore Council. Um, it gives me much pleasure and honor to be given the opportunity to partner with IPI on their Tech Innovation Conference again. This is the fourth year IPI has actually invited Design Singapore as its knowledge partner for their flagship conference. I'd like to thank Lapwai and his team for their efforts on organizing this conference and their strong support and belief that technology and design go hand in hand and are essential enablers for transformation and innovation. In recognizing that design cuts across all sectors, IPI has given Design Singapore the opportunity to fund keynote sessions on design each day of the conference this year. So today we have invited speakers who will share how they're designing for sustainability in various ways and contexts from city planning to material exploration to business design. And tomorrow we'll focus on efforts made by both local and overseas designers to address our future food needs. On Thursday, day three, we will shine a spotlight on the role design plays in the realm of health and wellness, especially in a post pandemic world, which is very much on all of our minds. Also happening is the Design Think Tank, a networking and open innovation platform that we piloted with IPI last year. It seeks to spark new conversations among corporations, design consultancies, and technology solution providers. Businesses and organizations have traditionally tackled issues by either resolving them in-house or engaging an external group of stakeholders. And with the design think tank, we hope to see potential new synergies between designers and technologists, which may inspire new ways of addressing the various challenge statements from organizations. We have had companies commenting they were pleasantly surprised at how their problem areas attracted interesting players from the design and tech community. So this year, we can look forward to hearing from a Swedish life design company life science company on their challenge of addressing gestational diabetes, a food e-commerce site on designing an experiential engagement in a post-pandemic world, and a non-profit organization on designing an age-friendly community. So if you think this might be of interest or re relevance to you, do attend the virtual briefing by the respective companies at 1 p.m. tomorrow. Back to today's keynote on designing a sustainable future for our planet. As Elvin, the MC has mentioned, designers have a huge role to play in stewarding our resources and shaping our environment, especially in the choice of materials we use and how we design businesses to be aligned to sustainability goals. In this session, you'll hear from esteemed and prominent leaders in their respective fields as they share the importance of not designing for symptoms, but to design for systems, culture, and technology that are crucial in helping us address these wicked problems of climate change. Sustainability should be addressed at different levels, at country or city levels, at a cultural level, and at the organizational level. Understanding key levers and behaviors is also critical to designing effective solutions. I hope today's session will inspire all of you by presenting the possibilities of what one can achieve if we intentionally design our world. I also hope that over the next few days, you will get a new insights and perspectives on how design can play a much bigger role in getting our planet ready for the future. So thank you and let's have a blast. Thank you very much, Mark. Next, let's hear from Professor Jason Pomeroy from Pomeroy Studio and Academy 
on how design and research can deliver innovative, sustainable solutions that tap into opportunities and overcome today's challenges for future generations. Elvin, thank you very much, Mark. Thank you very much, too. And uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. So just to give you a bit of an overview as to who we are, what we do. Um, I'm the founding principal of Pomeroy Studio. We're designers and thought leaders of sustainable built environments. We are absolutely passionate about ensuring that we can be designing from the micro scale of a zero carbon home all the way through to the macro scale of zero carbon cities. And that covers a broad range of different services from master planning all the way down to the micro scale of designing the brochure. Pomeroy Academy is effectively the research and education arm of Pomeroy Studio. We're educators and researchers of sustainable built environments. And our research fields cover vertical urban theory, zero carbon developments, smart and sustainable cities, the role of urban greenery in our habitats, the role of culture as the fourth pillar of sustainability, and the role of prefab, precast modular construction to ensure that we can have cleaner, more greener delivery of construction projects. I have this sort of erstwhile alter ego as well uh, as a TV presenter where I have presented shows for Channel News Asia and BBC and Discovery, whereby the root of culture and the green agenda can be brought to a broader audience beyond the lecture theatre. Now, you're probably wondering why on earth do I have this image of this three year old child? And if you haven't joined the dots already, that is me when I was three years old in my mother's back garden. I used to get down and dirty with the creepy crawlies. I used to borrow my mother's bed sheets and create wigwam tents. And I was thoroughly enjoying the idea of being the little young architect. Now, during that period of time when I was three years old, this is what the Alaskan glaciers would have looked like. Quite a cold, snowy, icy environment. But by the time I went off to Cambridge University to study architecture, I want to show you an image of what the, 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 the Alaskan glaciers looked like then. Quite a remarkable difference. I mean, if you adjust a toggle between those two places, I don't think you'd be able to recognize the fact that it's the same place. And I guess what we need to be conscious of is that the passing of time has also been quite unkind to our natural environment. We're increasingly seeing the ravages and the cataclysms of climate change affecting our natural and built environment. But I would say that the green agenda, and in particular, the sustainability agenda, doesn't go far enough in the 21st century. Everybody can wax lyrical about the social, the economic, the environmental being this perfect balance and that we need to have this understanding of social, economic and environmental parameters being in uh, an, an equal state to try and safeguard the planet for future generations. But what about culture? What about space? What about technology? We have been living over the past year and a half in this post-pandemic environment, which is actually incredibly pressurizing on our mental, social well-being, health and well-being. And I think we need to start thinking more carefully about the role technology, space and culture plays in our daily lives. Let's think about those six parameters and some of the effects of those six parameters that we need to address in our built environment. Since 2007, half the world's population has been living in inner city centres, and this is going to increase to 75% by 2050. Now, that naturally has a knock-on effect in our built environment. We need to be advocating for a greater spatial sustainability, especially if the current world population occupies 51 people per square kilometre, which is projected to increase to 66 people per square kilometre in 2050. You're probably scratching your heads and thinking, well, that seems an incredibly low number. But you've got to bear in mind that only 1% um, of our global area of the Earth is actually made up of cities. And 50 to 75% of that population are actually living there. What about the environment? While the world's cities only cover 2% of global land area, they account for a staggering 70% of greenhouse gas emissions. What about culture? Culture is being challenged in the wake of assimilation, globalization, and technological advancement. What does it mean to be half English, half Malaysian like myself? What does it mean to be Singaporean in this day and age? Increasingly, we need to be conscious about the cultural sustainability to preserve an understanding of where we are, where we come from, 
who our grandparents were and where we're heading in the future. And then what about the economy? Three trillion dollars is the value of the digital economy today. The value has been generated in the past 20 years since the internet was launched, a remarkable figure. And if we finally think about technology, if we want to continue enjoying life in cities and not live in dysfunctional urban habitats, then cities have to embrace technology in a more sustainable way. That means how do we integrate technology so it doesn't become a burden, but it can really enhance our lives, not just for the seven-year-old grandchild, but also for the 70-year-old grandparent. Ultimately, it calls for a bit of a design evolution or revolution. I leave you guys to be the judge of that. But when we think about the macro scale of the design of our cities, we have already seen how technology can be an incredible disruptor. Once upon a time, we saw the city of streets and squares, as we see in traditional Rome, where the square was seen as the outdoor room for our social interaction an opportunity for man to be actor and spectator in public. But with technological advancements, the, you know, the rise of air conditioning and artificial lighting and the automobile, we start to see a shift from the city of spaces to a city of objects. And arguably, we don't even need to be in cities anymore with the digital revolution. We can be living, working and playing virtually. And ultimately, it is that network connection of cities around the world that can allow us to be continuing to be productive and prosperous. I would argue that there are two types of designer. There is the person who is animal laborans, and then there's the person who is homo faber, to borrow Hannah Arendt's view of the world, if you will. And what does that mean in terms of the designer? Well, you've got animal laborans who just wants to go and get it done. Let's build the thing and worry about the consequences later and often leading to social and physical disjuncture in the built environment. And then you've got Homo Faber who wants to postulate, think constantly about their visions, always committing to paper, but not necessarily committing to bricks and mortar. I would argue that it's actually timely for us in the 21st century to think about a balance between these two characters, these two Hannah Arendt models. I think we need to be looking towards lateral sources of inspiration and also the ability to look to the past for reinterpretation of past precedents. Allow us to be the thinker, but let's get in the game and actually ensure that we can get things built. When I was designing the first zero carbon house in Asia, the Idea House, I took a leaf out of the automotive industry thinking about how the components of a car could come together in a factory and a car could be rolled off a production line with zero defects. Arguably, why can't we do the same with modern methods of modular construction? And yet, at the same time, we should be able to evoke the memories of the past. What are the lessons learned from our ancestors? Natural light, natural ventilation, the ability to have excess rainfall running off into the surroundings, the Kampong House being a perfect model for a reinterpretative, passive, sustainable design approach to yield a modern day zero carbon home, as you see on the right. Ultimately, the Idea House was a lesson in modular methods of construction, constructed in 14 days and provided a platform for us to explore how this prototype could be the answer to future tropical living at a mass scale. This was also the subject of a book that I wrote on zero carbon developments back in 2011. So as a segue into six ideas to effectively queue up this session and also provide a bit of inspiration, hopefully, I'd like to share six ideas to shape our future urban habitats. The first one, I think we need to embrace the great outdoors. And I think everybody has been crawling up the walls in a pandemic lockdown. Once upon a time, the flaneurs used to walk around in their noble dress and ultimately enjoy the great outdoors and socially interact with people. But with technology, we have run the risk of retreating internally into our virtual worlds. The pandemic has certainly meant that we've retreated a bit more indoors given the safe distancing measures. But there will come a time that we can actually re-embrace the great outdoors for all of its health well-being opportunities. We're applying this attitude of balancing technology 
with the ability to step back outside at the 89 hectare Kalang Alive Master Plan, a sports, recreation and leisure epicenter for Singapore sports and a beacon to creating the most sustainable, sustainable precinct of sports in the world. Ultimately, this does embrace technology insofar as it will allow people to test how fit they are and hopefully be an opportunity for a talent acquisition exercise for Sport SG. This loop that runs around effectively creating this five kilometer precinct also mirrors the past, provides an echo of the former Kalang Airfield precinct and thus helps re-evoke the story of aviation in Singapore in yesteryear. What about space? Let's use water as an alternative surface for urbanization. After all, when you consider the 35 mega cities of the world that have over 10 million people, we need to be increasingly conscious that these cities that have trillions of dollars poured into them are also areas of immense flood risk. I suggest you go and wear your Wellington boots when you go to Miami in 2050 because Miami South Beach may get slightly wet. And what that means is that we need to be thinking more creatively about our waterfronts. Amsterdam, I think, is a remarkable place in terms of innovations in water technology. But what they're also doing is looking at releasing the latent value of those disused docks and ports and turning those into real estate opportunities. This floating scheme in Eiberg is effectively the home to thousands of people who are looking to find more affordable means of accommodation in Amsterdam. And this is certainly a leaf that we borrowed when designing uh, the POG scheme in Venice. POG standing for Pod Off Grid, a zero carbon floating waterborne community that will provide an opportunity for not only people to live, work and play, but also having offshore vegetable and fish farms that can actually sustain the broader community. Something that was also covered in a book published by us in 2016. What about the environment? Let's plan for a carbon negative future as opposed to just a carbon zero future. If we look at the policies that are coming out that are advocating for zero carbon, I think they do need to go a bit further. We need to be a bit more ambitious and to start conceiving how our developments can be mini power stations to support the community. After all, 86 million barrels of oil are consumed on a daily basis, which is equivalent to filling five pyramids of Giza. That's a lot of consumption to sustain our everyday lives. So when we were designing the Bee House, uh, the first carbon negative house in Singapore, we took a leaf out of the Idea House book and then decided to take it one step further, effectively creating more energy than the house could consume so it could act like a living power station. And ultimately, as we look at further communities, more affordable communities, like the one that we designed here in the Philippines, we want to ensure that there is an element of self-sustenance and thus uh, an increasing amount of energy that can be then provided to the broader community elsewhere. Certainly important in times of resilience, especially if there are power outages. Four, culture. Let's ensure the built environment you know, is able to you know, ensure that we can actually balance and adapt to socio-cultural change. Growing up in London, I used to love going to Brick Lane, not just for the, um, for the bagels and uh, also the, the, the curries, but the fact that it was such a, a, an imprint of different cultures over the centuries. I particularly love this building on Brick Lane because in the 18th century, it was the home to French Huguenots who were escaping persecution in France. They built this Protestant chapel. By the 19th century, the Jewish immigrants that moved into Brick Lane brought their own industry and they turned the chapel into a synagogue. By the 20th century, a new bunch of immigrants came in in the form of the Bangladeshis and they turned that synagogue into a mosque. The layers of history cultural influence makes Brick Lane such a rich and wonderful place to be hanging out in. And we looked at those layers of history in the Secretariat project in Yangon. We have the privilege of being able to strip back those layers of British colonial history, but also at the same time celebrate the local heritage of the Myanmar people. 
in creating this arts and recreational complex that will be as much as a symbol of the past as it will be a symbol for future Myanmar. The economy. Let's design for a digital-based economy. What do these places have in common? Well, on the right, I will not mention the name of this very large tech firm, but they have certainly embraced the notion that knowledge is power. And when we look at the left, it is a Cambridge campus. Ultimately, these two places have a lot in common in that they look at knowledge as the incubator, the catalyst for, for retention of people and the sharing of ideas and the bolstering of the economy. What we wanted to do in this vertical office campus in Singapore, in the Alice building, was effectively create an opportunity for those young, upwardly mobile tech entrepreneurs to rub a few cents together, to create a place of their own. And as their company grew, they could then take larger startup offices, jumpstart offices and digital offices that would all allow these tech entrepreneurs to come together in a startup institution. The Sky Courts, the Sky Gardens being those opportunities for people to socially interact and share ideas and hopefully spark the next unicorn company. So it is possible to look at bricks and mortar being a catalyst to allow for economic growth. Finally, number six, technology. Let's embrace mobility to enhance our lives. A few years ago, I did a series called Smart Cities for Channel News Asia, which was then syndicated around the world because it was a, a, a effectively a mirror onto different cities and what made them smart. Amsterdam, Shenzhen, Bandung, Barcelona, Higashi, Matsushima, Singapore, just being some of the examples. And what's curious is that smartness to different places and people around the world means different things. In Singapore, I couldn't help but feel that element of urban greenery and the smart nation but if I was to look at Higashi Matsushima, it was very much about microgrid communities and the importance of fostering this culture of resilience after the Fukushima nuclear disaster. What we can see is that we can learn lessons from the past in order to inform the designs of the present and hopefully for future generations to learn from. This is the GOP office building that we designed as part of a broader smart city for cinemas land in Indonesia ultimately the first phase of a broader smart district, which has been coined by President Jokowi, the Silicon Valley of Indonesia. These samples were covered in my most recent book that was launched at the United Nations Habitat Group's World Urban Forum in Abu Dhabi prior to the pandemic, thankfully, back in 2019. And ultimately, some of those stories uh, reflected earlier in the presentation can also be found here. What of the future, therefore. So, initially we did cover what the city of spaces in the 18th century looked like, a series of streets and squares and outdoor rooms that allowed people to socially interact. And if the city of spaces was characterized by the horse-drawn car in the, ninth, in the 18th century, and the city of boulevards was characterized by the tram in the 19th century, and the 20th century city of objects was characterized by the airplane to keep us moving, not just from city to city, but country to country. Perhaps the 21st century city will be the hybrid vertical garden city that will be characterized by the aerial vehicle. Technology has always been an informer or an informant of the way that we see and perceive our cities. And if it was from horse-drawn cart, to tram, to car or aeroplane, perhaps the drone technology will be our future. From delivery drones for food and online shopping, to personal aerial vehicles to and from the comfort of your own skycourt, or aerial public transportation from the convenience of a public sky garden. This is something that we want to share with you in the future, a future that is all about going mobile, I'll save that for another time. But in the meantime, some of those ideas can be captured in my book on sky courts and sky gardens. To that end, I thank you for your time. And I guess, Alvin, it's over to you. 
Thank you very much, Jason, for that wonderful uh, sharing. And thank you for sharing your three-year-old lying down on the grass. We really all should be lying on the grass uh, more often. Now, following Professor Jason Pomeroy's uh, insightful presentation, uh, Assistant Professor Carlos Bannon from the Architectural Intelligence Research Lab at Singapore University of Technology and Design will discuss how we can work towards a more resource-efficient architecture, engineering and construction. Thank you very much for the introduction. I will go straight to the point. So I'm going to share 10 research questions uh, to rethink the way that we build our environment. Because our industry creates more than 20 million tons of construction waste every year. And we, we can use technology to, to contribute to lower the levels of energy in the production to up 25%. So in the Architectural Intelligence Research Lab at SUTB, we implement technologies with a positive impact in sustainability. So we try to redefine bottom up, even the interventions could be small, but the impact could be huge to tackle critical problems relevant to our built environment. The first research question is, can we build an entire space out of packaging waste? So out of the 80 million tons that are uh, waste uh, uh, produced by packaging waste, uh, half of it is actually landfill. So D.B. Schenker approached us to, to create something with the waste. And we turn wooden pallets, plastic bottles, polyurethane foams, and cardboard into furniture. So by using technology and digital design, we created different pieces of furniture, like this cardboard table, this pallet table, or most importantly, addressing the problem of plastic by upcycling plastic collected from the sea into large scale chandeliers. So we developed the full process to shred, process into filament and to print components that are connected by the workers, actually the actual DB single workers in this chandelier out of the plastic bottles. So actually we can, we can make really big scale components using recycled materials. And these ones actually are printed in our lab. Those components are processed into pellets and printed in large scale panels layer by layer. So it's a total of 250 kg of plastic per chandelier, which is more than 2,000 bottles. And this is the space. It's the first space in Singapore, which all the parts have been upcycled or recycled. So it will be open next month, and it's part of the Archifest event. It will be covered by Channel News Asia, the new documentary that is coming up. Second, can we scale that um, into, into, into architectural features using biopolymer 3D printed parts? So with 3D printing, standardized components are no longer relevant. We can print a bespoke components to create complex surfaces by developing scripts that adapt the geometry to the singularities. So we created this cladding surface in which the 3,500 tiles are completely different to each other and they're assembled in a completely novel way. So even the details are completely redefined to create this elegant surface. So now it's sitting in the SCTV campus and received the Singapore Good Design in 2020. Third, can we use more organic matter in our built environment? So we look at bamboo as a renewable, fast growing and powerful carbon sink. And typically bamboo is allegedly like a traditional way of building, right? So we wanted to redefine by using technology so we cut at the ends of the bamboo and we scan it. It's a simple 2D scan. We create the profiles, we rasterize them, and then we vectorize, creating 3D printed components that fits perfectly the shape of each of the bamboo poles. This family of nodes is completely related. So we basically develop a strip that produces all the parts and it's automatically printed. The connection system is really strong and tested. We tested in our lab. And we put it in touch with the public. So we built this canopy in Tanyo Bagar. It's built for three years, for three months, sorry. You can see the tectonics, the connection between the nodes and the bamboo poles as a natural extension, the complete novel way of building with bamboo. It created a nice spot in the back alley of Daxton Hill area. 
And we use the system to create uh, really biodegradable low cost structures. So this is a very rapid um, deployable structure, extremely low cost and low carbon, carbon sink. Next, the fourth question is, can we, can we build a more resource efficient and 100% biodegradable farming system to tackle food security in Singapore? So we use FDM technology, which is the most widespread 3D printed technology in the world, to print the trouts using biopolymer plastic. We created an A-frame structure using bamboo. We engage local farmers and our students and researchers to build a first prototype of 100% biodegradable vertical farming system. So the project is currently being exhibited at the Sustainable Academy uh, at CDL, and it will be up, uh, upgraded and scale up into uh, new developments and HDBs in Singapore in the next years. Next, can we use 3D printing to increase the performance of architectural structures, hence reducing the weight? So yes, and there are reasons for that. First, because 3D printing creates zero wastage in the fabrication. Second, because the radical aesthetics are really appealing for architects and designers. And third, because we fully unlock freeform designs. So if you look at the left, the components are standardized. With 3D printing, that doesn't make any sense anymore because we can go for freeform without, without additional cost. So these were experiments done by Arup in 2009. And we designed this connection system in 2015 where we tested the idea of creating tetrahedral meshes that are extremely lightweight and can span long lengths. So this is, you can, you can actually, with our script, you can create any shape that is discretized into the tetrahedrons. And then we print the nodes, not just the whole thing. We just only print the parts that are needed to be printed so we don't disrupt the industry. Our script creates the model, label the nodes and the bars, calculates the cost, so at the very early stage, you can know exactly the cost of the structure. You can make changes to reduce and optimize even um, according to the budget. All the parts are printed and designed. This is a 3D model optimized for the perfect orientation. And we get each of the connections that are needed to create this canopy. You can see pictures of the family of nodes were produced, all 3D printed in nylon and the quality of the space and the materiality almost disappears in the main atrium of SCTD. Next, we push the system forward. And since we have space inside the structure, can we use it to run systems? So in this art installation, we tested the idea of creating a cloud where LEDs were filling up the space inside the structure that we print. We created a family of 164 nodes, all of them looking like these beautiful crystals and they were integrating 54 LED systems in a total of 54,000 uh, individual uh, LED points. You see the first parts that were assembled in the fabrication lab in the SPD. They were taken to the site. And with the help of our researchers, the structure was lifted and rotated. You can see here how light it feels. It was placed on top of the supports. We love to engage community and our researchers to actually be part of not just the design, but the assembly um, and to, to really um, get them involved in each of the steps of, of, of the fabrication process. And this was the, the result. It was uh, for a month at uh, Marina Bay in Singapore. You see the quality of those nodes, integrate the LED lights and react to the presence of people. People can touch the lights. So the maturity was completely new and was shining next to the Marina Bay Sands building. We ran some 
rigorous uh, load tests. So this is me pulling from the keynote and the research team testing the boundaries of it. So the structure was extremely sturdy. We had actually, it's a, it's a, it's a very lightweight structure like that could actually um, support like uh, the weight of the two of us till we collapse it. And with these structures, typically we have a problem, right? When we finish the festival, what do we do with it? So in terms of security, we gave it a second, a second life. So we always think about what to do next. And next was to redesign it in a form of a chandelier that was shining in the National Design Center. We reprint new bubbles, new light, bu light bulbs that are actually shining inwards towards the cloud and created this experience for the visitors. Next, reducing the weight of the structures is possible by 3D printing. So we created the air table to transfer a 200 kg load into three minute points. It's a very structural, it's a very uh, daring structural, structural challenge that we achieved by creating this mesh of only six millimeter thickness of the bars. So these are the small 3D printed nodes that transfer the loads. You can see here the 3D model, how complex it is, only doable with 3D printing. Prototypes, we use threaded connections, assembly system, and the result. You can see the connection is flash and the quality of the object is really elegant. So the load is transferred to the small supports on the bottom, only six square centimeters in total. Then we thought about integrating AI to really go beyond what we can think as designers and use machine learning to go uh, one step further to create higher performance structure. So from A to B, there are many ways, but this are the ones that are reducing the weight of material and only place mass where it's needed. So we work with Voxel at Germany to develop the technology to print the molds to cast these bronze legs that were polished here in Singapore and were integrated into a piece of furniture that now is part of the collection of SCTD furniture. And nine, we turn this learning into a space. So we wanted to create the entire space producing zero wastage in construction. Always look at nature as a source of inspiration. Airmesh's very lightweight structure replicates a neural network, its complexity and efficiency. The foam is a representation of a traditional Chinese lantern created for the Gardens by the Bay's Mid-Autumn Festival. Our goal was to create as light a structure as possible by spreading the forces into very thin elements throughout 3D printing. It drastically reduces the use of materials and the entire structure's embodied carbon footprint. For the user, the idea is that the structure matters less. It is about the enjoyment of the surroundings. Behind the outward simplicity of the Airmerge Pavilion, there's a complex and robust structure delivering the experience. We design a whole new construction system that allows for more adaptable and freeform designs as compared to more traditional space frames that are limited by standardized nodes bars and angles. Using 3D printing in stainless steel, each of its bespoke joints is computationally generated, integrating a concealed connection system. That simplifies dramatically the construction sequence, so connecting a node to a bar is akin to assembling one big piece of IKEA furniture. In a sense, we have made an ultra-high performance structure accessible to more people that allows for rapid deployments. What's also great is we have actually managed to achieve zero wastage material in its construction. Airmesh has set the precedent, not just for Singapore, but truly for the world on the possibilities of 3D printing technologies in our built environment. This small pavilion has punched above its weight and already gotten the world's attention. We are ready to scale the system to design bridges, long span shelters, or multi-story spaces to bring across our confidence in this technology and blaze a path for the future of construction in Singapore. Uh, 
and last, will our future buildings be lighter, more adaptive, and efficient? So if we think our buildings, I would say 99% of the buildings are done in the same way that have been done in the last 100 years, right? Not much technology was uh, added to it, but uh, I think we need to restart fresh. We need to rethink the way that we build in a way that we can build less to make more. And we're integrating the system that we have presented in AirMesh with HTP and NetaTech to create vertical farms as an addition of existing buildings in Singapore that's coming by end of the year and early 2022. So lastly, um, any question, I'm always like reachable at air at sd And you can learn more by uh, reading the book, 3D Pinter Architecture, which compiles some of the words I have presented here more in depth in a more technical way. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carlos, for that very exciting presentation. Next, we have Andreas Hauser from SAP App House Network, who will share how sustainable innovation can be a reality by combining the empathy of users' needs with design thinking and enterprise architecture. Yes, thank you very much. I'm really excited for the invitation. I'm happy to talk about what SAP is doing in the area of sustainability. And I'm really convinced that design plays a major role in our future. And there's a great opportunity for every designer, either in the architectural world, but also in the business world. Now, if you look at SAP, SAP is an, a big enterprise resource planning company, a business company, we build software, business software. And our vision is help the world run better to improve people's lives. And all what we do is really related to the sustainability goals. Now, um, SAP, we have more than 425,000 customers, more than 21,000 partners who build solutions on top of our products and technologies, and more than 100,000 employees. And you know, if I look at myself, um, I now lead the global design team since more than 20 years, and I'm really passionate about human-centered innovation and uh, about the importance of design. And my big, big challenge is how do I get design into these huge ecosystems of millions of people globally distributed? And uh, um, if I look at sustainability, um, there were, we're we currently in the third wave. Um, and we start, started with industrialization, then globalization. And I think uh, sustainable business is now the third wave of digital transformation um, that we as a as software company really want to enable with enterprise software solution and services. And if you look at what's happening in the world is um, with diminishing planetary resources, with the climate change, uh, but also looking at the social and, and economic environment, businesses are not only measured anymore just on profit, but on the purpose. And uh, this has a huge impact also now on, on, on all the companies. 48% of CEOs implement sustainability in their business operations. This means if you look at 400, uh, more than 400,000 uh, customers, more than 200,000 already start implementing this. I know they run the business. And when they run the business, what they need is getting sustainability aspects like measuring CO2 emission in their entire life cycle, in the value chain. And also, if you look what is happening, consumers are changing their behavior. They are looking, looking for sustainable packages, for sustainable products. Um, employees, uh, if you look at talent, are looking for companies um, that are responsible employers. And uh, there are more and more regulations, regulations coming that need to be supported by the systems. SAP is doing two main things. First of all, we implement sustainability aspects into our business software that our customers 
can monitor it and, and better implement sustainability processes in the organizations. But also we are an exemplar. We want to be a definitely good citizen. We folk, for example, we only focus and, and use renewable energy as a company. And there are many, many other things SAP is doing. Now, if you look at, um, at uh, our mission, help the world run better and improve people's lives, there is one important aspect that many people forget if they talk about business and technology. These are the people. We talk about humans. And this is the reason uh, why we invented SAP's human-centered approach for innovation. And, and how is this process all about? We start with people. We start with design thinking, start understanding what are the real challenges um, of the end users, of our customers. Then we do user research, we step into the shoes of the people, then we get into ideation, design, create mock-ups, visualize, because the picture is more than a thousand words. But very important is finally, it's about delivering it. Delivering it, making innovation real in the environment of the customer. And here's what, what we see very often happening. There are many companies uh, who build cool concepts, uh, cool proof of concepts, but never made it real. And if you look at about innovation, it's all about making it real, getting it in the hands of end users, and finally running and scaling it. And if you look at the presentations before, uh, that also applies there. It's finally about creating innovation, making it real, but finally also how can you scale it globally and make it happen. Um, and if you go to our webpage, apphouse.sap.com, you find lots of tools and best practices that support that process. You can use all of this for free. Now let's make some, some examples. Roy Greenland, um, big, big fishing company. Um, and their goal was looking for sustainable fishing from sea to fishermen to table. Um, and what they had, if the fishermen, um, they had to, when, when they sell the fish, when, when, when they come back from fishing, and this was all done, for example, on paper. What, what we did, one of our app host network partners, they, um, they built a mobile application. Every fish, fisherman um, got it. And they were really excited. More than 2,200 fishermen now use technology, for example, to do the purchase orders um, um, in, in a digital format. In the past, they did everything on paper. That means 70,000 purchase orders converted from paper to digital. Three, five to three billion euro worth of fishing annually. And the nice thing is there was no training required for the people. That's one example how we support with technology, focusing on the people, really sustainable businesses um, all around the world. Another example is Vestas. Um, um, Vestas has uh, wind turbines um, and they are probably the biggest player. Um, they produce 140 kilowatt uh, with wind turbines, which is about 18% um, of the global installed base. And uh, they have thousands of these turbines and they have for sure, people, technicians, uh, who need to repair and maintain them. Uh, in the same approach, using our human-centered approach for innovation, we went with the people, we looked how to work, we designed a mobile application made it real and as a result um, more than 10,000 people use it they service 80,000 turbines every year um, and they save more than 400,000 hours every year by, by um, improving the work with the mobile solution again another example how to make innovation real applying a human-centered approach for innovation in the business environment now, these were both two examples where we used a human-centered approach for innovation, making innovation real, having technology products to really make it happen. But if you look at culture, to transform an organization, you need leadership buy-in. 
And we have five principles. Uh, our innovation culture framework to sustainable innovation has five key elements. You need to have leadership who leads in a different way. It's not anymore about the top-down leadership because the world changes so fast. It means you need to empower employees. And this is a completely different leadership style. Then the key are the people. You need to have the right skills in your organization. Technology skills, the business skills, but also the skills, how to embed people into the process, how to do user research, how to create ideas, how to turn ideas into designs, and finally making it real. Then it's the process and also the place has an impact on creativity. And uh, we're coming to, in a second, talking about the App House, what is all about, what I'm doing at SAP. Um, and what you would see here, you see also link here, apphousesap.com tools. We have tons of tools and best practices for free um, on our webpage. Now coming to SAP App House, we are an innovation lab. Um, started now eight years ago. And, and our vision is deliver human sent innovation to all customers. And you see the magnitude of, of the challenge with more than 400,000 customers, 18,000 partners, 100,000 employees who honestly are very technology focused, product focused, eh? and charging, changing into into more human-centric world, focusing also on sustainability aspects. And what we do is we apply this human-centered approach to transform business data into customer value using our business technology platform, which is our platform where all partners or customers can build innovations on top. And what you see here is a picture of our app house in Heidelberg. It's a creative space. It's in an old tobacco building. It doesn't really look like SAP. You walk by a Winsung studio, by a kindergarten, you come in, all walls are writable. And the creative environment fosters creativity. And you know, most customers of SAP don't expect it. Um, what we have, you know, started eight years ago, five locations that are run by SAP in Heidelberg, Berlin, Germany, but also Palo Alto, New York and Seoul, Korea. Um, and I thought about, you know, if you, if you go back to our mission, our vision to get humans and innovation to all customers, I thought about how can we scale that? Five years ago, I started with a franchising model. That means SAP partners, meanwhile, we have 16 of them all over the world, um, have a creative space. They use SAP's human-centered approach for innovation. They have people with design, design thinking skills. They lead the organization in an empowering way. And for sure, they use our technology. They all have the same culture and are all like-minded. And they're all over the world, yeah? from New Zealand recently opened to Australia, to the UK, but also China. And there, these partners are more than six thousand employees and they all build innovative solutions putting people into the center we hosted more than 3,000 workshops more than 75,000 visitors we executed as an app hosting more than 1,000 customer projects and really learned how this human-centered approach for innovation leads to better results our currency because we're an innovation lab with an SAP our currency is customer success we created more than 180 customer stories, customer references. They get on stage, talk about SAP as the innovation partner of choice. And we won the more than 40 awards and recognitions, design awards, but also innovation awards in, in various different aspects. And you know what excites me so much about it? Because I started with designing um, our solutions, some of our new cloud solutions. I was leading global design teams. And I really feel and see the power of design. But very honestly, design in the, from a much more strategic perspective, it's not just designing something which looks beautiful. It's about designing something that creates business value and it is technically feasible. Um, and I did some time ago a presentation wow. about, about the, the, the move um, into business design, what is really required. I see a huge opportunity in the business world, a uh, huge opportunity for designers, but it's important. It's not just about making things nice. I think this time is over. 
It's about creating something where you can make innovation real and you can scale globally. This requires understanding business a little bit and this requires understanding also technology. Um, and I hope I could give you a little bit some aspect what SAP is doing, what we are doing as an innovation. Feel free to visit our webpage. You will find lots of examples, best practices that you can use in your daily life. And with this, thank you very much for inviting me again and looking forward to the conversation now. Thank you very much, uh, Andreas. Before we proceed to the panel discussion segment, we'd like to encourage you to submit your questions in the Q&A feature on your screen. Mark Wee, Executive Director of Design Singapore Council, will be the moderator for this panel discussion. We will invite our three speakers back on screen as well. Great. Well, thanks, uh, Jason, uh, Carlos and Andreas. I know I just want to give a shout out to Andreas. Uh, he's calling in from Germany. So it's probably, I think, maybe 4 a.m. right now. So thanks for keeping up. Um, I think because of such uh, great presentations and, you know, I think all of you all touched really about sustainability in different ways from really around sort of uh, um, systems, right? Um, 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 materials and even sort of, uh, I guess, uh, the built environment as well as as, as even software and what runs the enterprise today. I think that's really kind of given us a good spread. I'm also conscious of time. We're gonna gun for this to, um, uh, we have about 15 minutes, but I also know that Carlos is, uh, has to step out at 12.05. So um, instead of jumping into my own selfish questions, uh, the truth is that we've had a whole lot of questions coming in and I'm just gonna jump straight to it. And Carlos, perhaps I'm gonna push some questions that are directed at you from the audience to be able to answer as well. Sure. Um, so there's a question from, a, uh, 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 from the floor, from a, uh, Thomas. Uh, he's asking, when you mentioned that the structures you built are 100% biodegradable, how long will it take to be degraded? <laughs> that was really the question. <laughs> and yeah. uh, do you want to answer to that quickly, I guess? Yes, quickly. That, that kind of plastic that we use from bioplants is basically 50 years, the process to degrade. Okay. Good to know. All right. Uh, another question for you, uh, Carlos, is what are the challenges faced in scaling up bespoke 3D printed structures and how were these overcome? Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good one. We we're trying to figure out that, right? I mean, uh, 3D printing has limitations of size. So what we found a way to actually to overcome that limitation is to not to print the whole thing. I think that the, the problem when you want to print the whole, let's say, house or the whole element in one, in one single go is very challenging. There are limitations in weight, in scaffolding needed and stuff. So we, we reduce the printing parts to where it's actually needed. So we integrate the standard parts with the printed parts so we can actually benefit from the prefabricated parts from industry and we print the, the, the components that unlock the freedom of our system. So that's a way to, to, to really scale and, and, to, and to keep kind of the, um, not, I mean, not to disrupt the industry uh, uh, very abruptly. I see, okay. Well, another question that came on that back was, um, what were your thoughts on whether you see generative design playing a key role in architecture? And if this approach actually lends itself to use of more natural sustainable materials such as bamboo, I mean, do you see that sort of really being able to be scaled in a more permanent way within architecture? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I really see that. I mean, for instance, maybe in Singapore, we have a bit of more limitations with the use of materials uh, just to comply with the codes, but we can see successful constructions in Indonesia, or uh, in Vietnam using, um, using bamboo that actually are long lasting with proper maintenance. So I think that um, even bamboo is seen as a kind of traditional material, but it's a very strong, very uh, powerful um, you know, um, construction, construct, construction material. And I see that um, industry is moving to, towards more sustainable materials and strategies. So I believe that um, bamboo is gonna play a strong role in construction in the next future. Okay. Um, perhaps this is a question for all, I guess you can answer, but uh, it's really around, uh, maybe it was a question first directed at Jason. Uh, someone, I mean, uh, Ben mentioned how it's uh, really a conviction for universal design, 
but how do you think Singapore has actually fared well in this area and how does smart technologies able to play a bigger role for universal design? I think it's something that both Jason and Carlos could answer, but even Andreas, I think even just that about smart systems, right, in business. But J Jason, would you care to kind of like answer that question first? Yeah, I mean, I think that when we think about universal design, it, it always runs the risk of flying in the face of people and culture and this ubiquitous one size fits all approach doesn't necessarily bode well for reflecting the local culture and the local traditions of a people. So as long as that universal design system and you focus on the process as opposed to the product, I think bodes well. So if for instance, you were able to ensure that there is the balance of not only having this process, this system that works well to the tropical climates of Singapore, but can be adaptable to the temperate climates of Northern Europe or the hot and arid climates of the Middle East and can still have space to be able to embrace the local socio-cultural idiosyncrasies of the people, then I think it bodes very well. We just need to ensure that we don't get overtaken by the technology. Use technology wisely that can then be put into the hands of the people and their culture so that they can adapt it so it suits themselves. I see. I see. Okay. Uh, Carlos, when you answer that question, I just wanted to bring in, there was another question that sort of... Uh, was referencing, someone from the audience was referencing what you're mentioning. You said you kept on mentioning not to disrupt the industries a few times. Yeah. And I guess with your technologies are really, really, I would say contributing to smart technologies that could disrupt the built environment. What are your concerns if you have a disrupt about having a disruptive innovation to break new ground? We keep on talking about not disrupting <laughs> tech industry. <laughs> are you are you a concern? Are you are you just being polite? <laughs> <laughs> Good one. No, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, um, conservative in a way that not disrupt the structure. Basically, it's like try to implement things now, right? So how, how can we do things in a way that work with the current ecosystem? So if we if we redefine everything, it's quite difficult even to get it fabricated, right? So we can do experiments, but we want to target a bit more like um, uh, construction that can be done now uh, with the current manpower, with the current uh, uh, workers. We think that building on what happens when I mean, what what industry produces and, and and hack it more than redefine it fully? I think probably it's a, it's a way to go for now. Uh, I really see that it will change, but I think the construction industry really has a really slow pace. The change is quite you know it's quite slow. The inertia of our industry is, is is quite high. So so realistically talking, we think that if we want to act now, we we need to somehow combine existing materials and existing technologies uh, with with new ones. Okay, well, Andreas, I wanted to kind of direct this thing. I mean, for you, it's like different. It's really around putting technology in the hands of people, involving them in being able to design sort of like a, a easy way to interact with technology to change the world. How do you see that maybe becoming? What's the reality of that becoming more commonplace? And what's the reality of that in transforming how people are involved in the design of your systems in the smart city of the future? And that, that's a very good question. I think you see that uh, we need to be very careful that technology is not overtaking. And very often people just talk about technology because it's about cool technology. If you look what's happening, there's so many sensors now, IoT devices, and lots of data is created, but people have challenges making something meaningful out of it. Mm -hmm. And I think this is something where, where you need to involve the people and something that you, um, where this approach for involving the people in this process is really, really key. And Jason was also talking about um, some of the future with the drones. We see the same thing happening also in business where in warehouse, you start having drones doing some work. Mm. Um, my feeling is, I think it's, I think it's finding the right combination. Yeah, and important is, as a designer, you need to understand what the future capabilities are of technology mm. to design the right things, um, and you need to understand what's the business value for the customer. 
Um, and I think it's a it's an it's an amazing opportunity to really, if you know, get back what is the what is the the, the, the topic that we talk about. We talk about sustainable future, and I think um, we designers designers play a key role in in always emphasizing the human the human aspect in this uh, in this um, entire system, this entire framework, um, and therefore really i think a great opportunity for design to really get to the next level oh carlos i know if you have a leaf don't worry about it don't feel stressed out we'd love to see you again uh, i think everyone i've thrown all the questions i could <laughs> i'm sure there's more um but please thank you. Uh, thank you for being here yeah thank you very much Bye. jason i just wanted to kind of um maybe ask you for your reaction to what Andreas has said, because you, in the context of cities of the future, what do you see the involvement of, I mean, Andreas talks about how people really need to be engaged in the design yeah. of technology. What, what's your view about that even for cities going forward? I mean, you know, versus the, our past. Yeah, I, I can't agree more uh, with, with Andreas in, in that, um, if you're not careful, you can be, for instance, collate, collating so much data, but what for? It's if, if you're not careful, it's rubbish into the system and rubbish out. Mm. When, when I think about digital twinning, when I think about virtual mapping of cities, you collect all of this data and then people are scratching their heads thinking, what am I going to use this for? So we need to ensure that there is a real social purpose in what we're doing. And that's why I think that the most successful smart innovations, let's just say for smart cities and the built environment, is one that doesn't just keep the design of the system amongst the, the upper echelons of government to dictate this is what the city will be. Let's collect all of this data and worry about what's going to happen with the data afterwards. It's the people saying, this is how I want to use the technology because I know it's going to enhance the quality of my life within the city. And so if I was to look at examples like Bandung, where you have those young techno entrepreneurs who are wanting to share data and think about how am I going to improve my mobility within the city by creating a new app that shares the location of the nearest jump on jump off bus. There is an immediate social purpose that's going to be of benefit to the child and grandparent to be able to move around the city with ease. And if it's from a bottom up, I think it has huge effect. Going back to what um, Carlos was saying earlier about, again, technology and scalability of that technology, I, I would hazard that whilst it's a lovely idea to see those technologies kind of get implemented at a city scale, the biggest barrier to change is people's perception. And I think that one major issue will be how do you convince those real estate developers to start mm -hmm. putting in bamboo structures that may not necessarily be able to scale the heights of 80 stories or 100 stories today? What we need to do is start incrementally and have all of these um, living labs. And Singapore is a perfect platform as a living laboratory to test the ideas mm -hmm. as he is doing. We need to engage with societies like yourself, Mark, to ensure that we can test ideas and see that they can scale, but not to a point where we're trying to scare the industry to think this is the future. Well, the future happens incrementally. And I think that's where we need to try and find that right balance. Hmm. Actually, just to that, Jason, um, there was a question here that sort of builds off a strain of what you talked about. Uh, it says, I'll just uh, say word for word from Ian. How can a community cost effectively retrofit its existing old buildings and built environments to make them more in line with current day sustainable green framework? I know it's not exactly the same, but this view about bringing community yeah. thinking right from a ground up, how do you sort of, yeah, yeah what, what's your answer to that? Well, first of all, uh, it depends on where you are. Are we talking Singapore? Are we talking the UK? Or are we talking Switzerland? I mean, I think that if, let's just take a, a slightly universal approach. Let's just assume that governments are willing to listen to the voice of the people. The first thing I would say is that community need to go and speak to the, uh, the, the powers that be and, and basically set up 
a community think tank to say, OK, this is what we want to do. It has social purpose. There's going to be economic value and it's going to be green. And also it's going to respond to my culture. I'm going to use technology wisely and we're going to be optimizing the use of the space. So what I would call the six pillars of sustainability from our side, use the triple bottom line, but also think about space, culture and technology. And I would engage with those powers that be and enter into a broader conversation to align all of those green values so that everybody becomes an active stakeholder. I'll then engage with academia, people like Carlos with a Think Lab to test those ideas. I'll then reach out to the corporation and say, hold on, there might be a bit of money to be made out of this idea. And if we're all on side, we can then put pressure up to the government to see how this could be legislated in the future. So I would say that the real success of a community based project is don't just think about it as a community. Also engage with academia, civil society, naturally, corporation and the state. Get them all around the table to share the green values and then you can have a project that is worth building hmm. wow. I, I wonder whether I mean, i'm just curious i see both of you on the screen i'm wondering in the future of smart cities would you see more andreas and jason like working together <laughs> well i certainly hope so <laughs> I mean, and, and certainly that's the model that we're currently applying so <laughs> I, I, I can tell you a story, I think, if you, um, if you look at our app house, which is a creative space. Yeah? Mm. And uh, I did, we did tons of customer projects where customers starting creating innovation spaces yeah? mm. because they want to transform the organization, want to make something different. Um, honestly, most of them close after two to three years. Why? Because you know, they, they have an architect creating a good design. What they lack is people who have the right skills. They don't have a clear goal what to achieve with it and even don't have a process how to make things happen. They didn't have the culture. And for example, when, when we build up our app powers, um, I think uh, I was lucky that I could work like a startup and also it's a big company at SAP, but I gave the task to the team to design the space. I said, use your budget. You can now buy a sofa for 5,000 euro or 500. I don't care. What happened? They brought a sewing machine. Um, they built stuff on their own. They bought stuff at a second hand shop and it became their space. Yeah? Mm. And this is the way how you empower the employees to be part of transforming and creating what they where to work. And honestly, it's not more expensive than just doing this top down and making something nice and beautiful. And, there, and we even offer this kind of service to our customers. Honestly, when we started ADA, we started with SAP usability sucks. We were like escalation team. And this whole thing converted into, oh guys, the way how we do this, we, we don't know, we don't have the skills, can you help us? And we even were asked by our customers, now we're a software company, but they ask us, can you help us building up a creative space? Hmm. Can you help us building up a, a team that transforms our organization? That means that one customer, for example, a Daimler, we help them building up design thinking team, train them in the methodology, in the process, how to engage with the end users. Because honestly, most technology, most companies have the challenge, whether this is now in, in, in cities or businesses, the challenge how to involve the people in this process. Hmm. And I think design thinking, or however you call it. I think I'm not, I'm not too much in methodologies, honestly. For me, it's really about involving the people. And now we have a process with five, five elements. Others have eight. Honestly, everything is the same. You involve the people from the beginning and you iterate very fast and come to the result, and make innovation real, however you call it. Yeah? But I think this, this transformation is something where we need to get more people yeah, on the world putting people in the center. And if you do this in the right thing, we can make amazing things happening, for sure with technology. Technology, is, is, there are great things that you can do. But I saw so many, so many crappy implementation of technology that really didn't create a value for customers. And I think you probably have the same thing in architecture, some things that look cool, great, you win awards, but there is no business behind it. I think looking, combining the elements 
to get something which is sustainable, it delivers value for people and it can scale that more people can benefit also all over the world. Hmm. That's the goal. Thanks, Andreas. I know I literally, I'm looking at the clock. I have one minute left. I'm going to maybe throw it to Jason to close it off. Thank you, Andreas, for that. I just want to say, I mean, with smart cities, with the theme of radical collaboration, with mm -hmm. more and more, with technology integrated more into buildings and the built environment shaping. I mean, Jason, any last words you want to end off with about what the future holds for all of us? <laughs> yeah, it's, oh, wow, and you've given me 40 seconds. <laughs> I, would, I would probably say that um, sometimes uh, there is a lot to be said for, you know, inventing the wheel but i would also say if the wheel has already been invented i think it's about adapting and looking to the past to ensure that we can learn the lessons from the past so i would look to the past as a source of inspiration as past priesthood distill those lessons in order to then design for the present and we just need to ensure then that we can adapt that for future generations so that it is flexible enough for them to learn from our mistakes. And I think that we, as designers, have this wonderful habit of thinking that we know everything, but we don't. And that comes back to Andres's earlier point that, you know, here we are sitting in our ivory towers. We shouldn't be. We do need to treat civil society as an important part of that design team. They can shape a brief for us. We can work with corporations and academia to test those ideas. And then we can see how state can help legislate those ideas to make for a greater urban environment in the future or a process or a product. So learn the lessons from the past, distill them, design for the present, and then hopefully that will be good lessons for future generations. Great. Well said. Thank you. And I'm going to thank you, both of you. And I'm just going to put it back to Alvin. And thank you for a wonderful session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Jason, Sister Professor Carlos Andreas, and Mark for your insights and perspectives. We've come to the end of this keynote on designing a sustainable future for our planet today. Thank you to our speakers and to all attending this webinar for your active participation please click on the info button on your screen to submit a rating out of five stars and your feedback before exiting this session or joining the next one. Now, during the break, check out our key partners on demand technologies showcases by selecting 22nd September under the agenda drop-down list. You can also chat secure a virtual one-to-one -one meeting or request for a call back with exhibitors by clicking the connect button in their profiles. If you are interested to speak to IPI tech experts, simply search for their names via the attendees button. Our next thematic session on IPI's crowdsourcing presentations from WS Audiology, Shell and Unilever will start at 1pm Singapore time. We'll see you after the break. <laughs>